So the song was about a savior who saved us. And the writer who is called Philip Bless always ended each stanza with a sentence, Hallelujah, what a savior. So in the hymn now, he has enumerated certain things which makes Christ a great savior. And these things he has enumerated when he says that he was the son of God, but he came downstairs to be with man. It continues and he says in the stanza two, very shame and scoffing good. In our place, he stood condemned. In stanza three, he was a spotless lamb of God, but he came for us. He was lifted up to die. And Philip Blaise in this hymn now had in mind the book of Hebrews chapter 2, the verses number 3. How then shall we neglect such a great salvation? Shall we pray? We are so grateful unto you, our Father who lives in heaven. We thank you for sending your Son to this earth to die on our behalf and for giving us such a great salvation. It is by this salvation that we can boldly come before your throne of grace and mercy for the word of God which can be able to save our souls. Be with us now and forevermore. In Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Amen. Shall you all turn with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, verses number 1 to the verses number 3. <coughs> this is what the scripture says. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? The writer of Hebrew throws a question to the early Christians, and he throws the same question to us. We will answer this question before we continue our discussion. And the question is, how can we escape such a great thing which is coming to us? How can we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? And the answer I'm going to give is that we cannot escape. The people who receive this book were kind of people who, according to somewhat the persecution which was coming on them, decided to go back to their days, decided to leave Christianity. And these are the kind of people whom the writer of Hebrew is talking to. And in the chapter number one, he spends time to talk to them about how great the Lord Christ is and what he has done unto us. He showed us the superiority of Christ and he stated certain things that we, you and I, are supposed to follow. He came down and reasoned with them, all oh, Hebrews, if we received all these, how then shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Some years ago, we were all sinners. Yes or no? Some years ago, we were all sinners. Yes or no? I remember in a local congregation, there was this boy 
whom I asked this question, have you sinned before? The person said no. Have you been a sinner before? The person said no. And his argument was, my mother is in the church, my father is in the church, I've been born in the church, so I've never seen you. I've never become a sinner before. But what a person understood afterwards was that he was once in the world. He wasn't part of the church. So he was counted with sins. So he appreciated the fact that he has sinned before, he has become a sinner before. We all have become sinners one way or the other some years ago. For some, it may be sooner. For some, it may be further. Some people were baptized a lot of years ago, about 30 years ago. Some people were baptized a year ago, yesterday, some few hours ago. So we are all once sinners. And the bottom line is that from the beginning of time, God has wanted man to live so joyfully, but we decided not to. That is the bottom line of every day. That is the bottom line of all that we are talking about now. In fact, if that incident had not happened, I wouldn't have come here to talk to you. I wouldn't have come here to reason with you. And we all know that incident is the incident of this ancient Adam and his wife, Eve. And that's where, that is what the bottom line is. For such a bottom line, God told man that man, I have created a perfect world and I have given you the east of Eden as a garden. Go there and live within this garden. Go there Take care of this garden, and whatever you want is found in this garden. That was the condition given to us. And the way Genesis pictures the whole idea of the Garden of Eden is so nice that no garden in this world can be compared to it. We don't have any garden. Of that sort. And the whole idea is that God gave man comfort. <laughs> like comfort. In the first place, man had no exam to write. I mean physical exam. In the second place, man had or man was not supposed to go sit down and study for hours. <clears throat> Nothing like, like that was there. In the third place, man was not supposed to think about what he was supposed to eat. There was always food. Man wouldn't have gotten sick. Man wouldn't have passed through all the sufferings that we are passing through now. Yes or no? Yes. That was a condition given to man. And it was so nice. And I know that in all our conversation, the think of man about, hey, if Adam had not done this. If you pass through suffering and you pass through a lot, it comes down to the fact that if Adam had not done this. And we tell ourselves each and every time that if Adam had not done this, you and I would have been in a better place. And Moses, in his discretion, in the book of Genesis chapter 1, verses number 39, shall we all turn our scriptures to Genesis chapter 1, verses number 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Moses is saying, behold, everything that God created was very good. It was perfect. Everything. Everything. 
everything he created was very good. There was comfort found in this. There was peace found in this. There was joy. Everything man can think of. Everything was in this garden because it was good. The entire creation, including the garden, everything was found in there. There was food, there was shelter. And I don't know whether there was a car or not. But there was not. There was nothing like that. But when I was going through the book of Genesis, I was reading a particular version. I will come there. And the scripture said that God drove man out of the garden of Eden. I was like, okay, God drove man. So there was a car. <laughs> Hallelujah. So there was everything that we can think of, every comfort. And this is what God told man in the verses number 28. And God blessed them, and God said to them, in the first place, they didn't do anything to deserve this blessing. God created them, and he just blessed them. And he said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Man did nothing to get this authority. I won't give it to you. You know how we struggle to attain higher positions in Ghana? In the world, a lot of bribes that you have to pay. You can ask the agenda boys. A lot of things that they have to do and share with India, they will do it every morning. They'll be standing at the gate greeting. Be our son's share. Some will be teaching A, B, C, D as well, which we don't need it. Look at what we put in to get to such a level of authority. But God said, subdue everything and have dominion or power over every creature. We didn't do anything to deserve that. We were like kings and queens in there. We didn't have to vie for someone to vote for us. No. That's what God gave us. And 29, God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree which seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. God never said, You have to get money to go and acquire these things. It's free. Free. That's what God said. We didn't pay for food. After a year, I have to go and think about what I will eat. Check my account if the money is enough to be able to acquire a little food. And if it doesn't, I resort to what? Gary. For a while. And after around for some of the bread will cook. I see if I'm coming to visit you, and I'll get something to eat. <laughs> or some of us have to, in our program outline for the semester, check all the programs going on on campus, and check for identity. Okay, this day I'll go here. This day I'll go here. So all these budgets have been covered. In the first place, God said everything is free. But man said no to all these things which was given to him. And how did he say no? In the book of Genesis chapter 3, the devil came to man. And man had a decision either to choose comfort or distress. Man had the power either to choose free or paid. Suffering or no suffering. A man, I don't know what happened. I tell you, no one should ask me. Man decided, I 
I will choose suffering. This is man. Man decided, I will choose pain. This is the same man we are talking about. What in man do man? And when you read through the book of Genesis chapter 3, the story is so terrible. And that is where the entire other chapters of the Bible starts to build up. So the devil deceived man, and man chose something which he is not supposed to. Now man has lost all the comfort that he had. Man has lost everything that he had. All the comfort that he had. All the free food. Everything. And that's the only part when I think about like if I would get free food on campus morning, evening, and he told me to go for the school for 16 years, I will. Why not? That's the part when I think about I always be like, why did they do that? They had all the authority to say, go, someone, the animal will go, do this, say this, something will happen. You just sit there, come and bath me, come and... That wasn't that thing they were doing, right? But if we had gotten that now, that's what we used to do. <laughs> that's the authority that man had. But in all this, man decided, no, and he decided to sin against God. And that's where the distress started. So a lot of curses, a lot of things were given to man. This is what you want. This is what you've chosen. Take it. And when you read from the verses number 14, when God starts enumerating all the cases that will come to man. Adam was there was like, when you read it, that's where all the suffering begins. That's the reason why we are here. That's the reason why the terrified and and tired and fat. That's the reason why. That's the reason why we struggle. That is the reason why we are always seeking that we will feel that hope in us, but we can't. That is the reason why we are always depressed, thinking about it. Hey, and we never say, that is the reason why. But the message I have for you, oh, there is a great salvation, say hallelujah. There is a great salvation, say hallelujah. Amen. In the midst of when God, when God was enumerating all these curses, in there, he gave man a way. In the curses, he gave man a way. Let's turn our scriptures to verses number 15 of the third chapter of Genesis. And let's read together. I put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. That's where our comfort lies. It is in this message. And when the two people heard this, I don't know how they took it, but I know that they will surely understand this. As he being in our distress, God has given us a chance. And this is the chance that God will put enmity between the devil and the woman. Between the offspring of the woman and the devil. And that offspring that we are talking about is Christ. That is the offspring we are talking about. 
So in Genesis chapter 4, the book of Galatians chapter 3, it talks about this one offspring. This one offspring who will give us salvation and who is going to take us and redeem us from what we are going through. So in this, what did God do? The Romans chapter 5, verses number 8. God did something. This is what God did. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, while you and I were still sinners, Christ died for us. Hallelujah. That is where our comfort lies. That is what gives us hope. That one day, that comfort that started in the garden is going to continue. In that, not while you were righteous. No, because you were not. Not while you were so pure. No, because you were not. But while you were so sinners, Christ died for you. And for me. And that's what the scripture tells us. And this demonstrates the love that God has for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and whosoever believed in him shall not perish but have eternal life. In all these distress, in all these things, God has given man another opportunity. And what is that opportunity? First, in that opportunity, he sent his son to die for us. In all these things, he sent his son to die for us. And when John was concluding, the book of Revelation, in the 22 verses number 14, John also gave us hope. 22 verses number 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes, so that they may have the right to the tree of life, and that they may enter the city by the gates. That is the hope John also gave us. And that is in connection with what Paul talked about, that Christ died for us. That is in connection with what John himself spoke about in chapter 3, verses number 16 of his gospel account. So when we go to Genesis chapter 3, verses number 24, God said, so, saw that man had become like one of them. So he had to drive man out of the garden, decide that he won't get back to the garden to take the tree of the knowledge of the tree of life. <coughs> and John is telling us that that opportunity has been given again in verses number 14. That Christ is going to give us opportunity once again another time. We are all going. No one is staying here. Say hallelujah. We don't want you to stay. And I wouldn't stay either. So John says that person will give him, will give him the chance to the tree of life once again. We are all marching to Zion. We are all marching to the city. We are all marching to Aden. We are going to take the fruit of the tree of life. Who is not going? Who is not going? Who is not going? 
if you are not going or if you go, it depends on these things. What the scripture tells us is that in the book of Mark chapter 16, the verses number 15 and 16, we are supposed to believe and be we are supposed to believe and be We are supposed to believe that the. Why don't believe that it says? That is the only chance God has given us. That for us to get there, believe that He died while you were still a sinner, and He's saving you. And be baptized. That's the opportunity God has given us. And I believe that most of us here. Have been baptized. And if you have been, what is expected of you? Hold fast what you you receive, lest you drift away. Hold fast that, lest you drift away. That's what it tells you. Now, I want to remind us that we received such a great salvation we were supposed to be condemned we have no place before God we have no chance to go back to the garden of Eden but the chance has been given once again and in this chance God is telling us to believe and be baptized you are supposed to believe the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and be baptized And if we be able to do this, we are supposed to hold fast the faith. Not wandering, not going elsewhere, but staying in the faith. What does it include? Living a righteous life. That's the only thing that will get us there. What about those who won't get opportunity to the Garden of Age? Let me tell you the story. It wasn't written yet. There was another garden. And that garden I will not tell you about. Those people go to that garden. Have you know that garden? The garden of destruction. Those who will not make it to the garden of Eden, those who will not make it to the city, those who will not make it to heaven, they are going to a different garden. It's not a guy. I'm calling it a guy. It is of destruction. That is the bottom line. It is of destruction. Beloved, as we sit here, we are reminding you if you've not been baptized, this is the only opportunity God is giving us. If you've been if you realize that we were once a sinner and be baptized, so we did the only way. Hold fast what you received and don't do it away. The one who visited us, we are reminding you, you always come. But what the scripture says is that if you are not saved, how do you get saved? Believe and be baptized. If you are not saved, you will not make it. That is the bottom line. No one will hide this from you. And we wouldn't. Because we love you. If you are not saved, what is no best required? But we jump back up. If you are in sin, why is no best And that is how it's going to be. Remember Matthew chapter 25, the story or the parable about the ten virgins. I think when they were going, they all took it to him. Hey, 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 h
So I have to live my life well. If I'm not saved, I have to be saved. And we know that God is going to help us and guide us. May the good Lord be with us. May the good Lord help us. Amen. Shall we pray? We thank you once again, our dear Father. We thank you for such a great salvation you've given us and what you've let us understand. We do pray that you be with us and guide us. We do pray that you come to repentance. That whichever sin that we've committed, whichever sin that we are struggling to stop, Father, you be with us and help us. We with those who don't believe, so that they will believe. Let them understand the word which saves, and we all together will march to Zion. In Christ's name, God, we do pray. Amen.